All right. So over the past couple of days, we've been talking about psychotherapy and learning about the different perspectives and how there are different approaches to treating mental illness. Psychotherapy is one way to treat psychological disorders. Biomedical therapy is another. We oftentimes find biomedical therapy being used with more serious disorders. In this process, one can physically change the brain's functioning by either altering its chemistry with drugs, or like we learned about yesterday in the presentations, shock therapy, magnetic impulses, and in some case, even surgery. So today, I'm going to really be focusing on drug therapy. Since the 1950s, um, drug studies have revolutionized how we treat people with severe disorders. And thankfully, medication, the introduction of medication, pretty much emptied out mental hospitals. There still are people who need to be institutionalized because of their severe mental illness, but with the introduction of medication, people were able to leave the hospital setting and on medication be relatively symptom-free and lead a quality of life back with their families and friends. One of the main definitions you need to relate to drug therapy is psychopharmacology. It's the study of the effects of drugs on mind and behavior. So in double-blind studies, if you remember, where both the participant and the researcher are unaware of who is receiving the actual drug or the placebo, Several types of drugs have been proven useful in treatment. So we're going to take a look at several categories of drugs, and you need to be able to relate the category of drug um, with particular drugs on the test. So the first category of drugs are antipsychotic drugs, and you need to be able to define it as um, dampening the responsive responsiveness to irrelevant stimuli. And when I think of irrelevant stimuli, one of the things that comes to mind is that of schizophrenia. And maybe the irrelevant stimuli would be the delusional thinking or the hallucinatory experiences that they might have. So um, oftentimes bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, um, other major illnesses, they might find that antipsychotic drugs are effective. A couple of examples is clo chlorprosamine, which is actually sold as Thorazine, clozapine, which is sold as Clozaril, and um, this particular drug tended to enable awakening. So people who had kind of withdrawn from society had flat affect. They found that clozapine or Clozaril kind of drew back their... their um, ability to interact with the, those around them. This picture that you see on the right, lower right hand side um, with Robert De Niro and Robin Williams is from a movie called Awakenings. And there were some people, like you see here, Robert De Niro's character that was in a catatonic state that remained motionless. We know that's one subtype of schizophrenia. And with the introduction of these antipsychotic drugs, he truly did awaken out of his catatonic stupor. So these antipsychotic drugs were very effective for many people. Some of the drawbacks to especially the first generation antipsychotic drugs, the first round that were introduced in the 1950s, um, were some of the side effects called uh, tardive dyskinesia. And we know that one of the main reasons why schizophrenia, schizophrenics have um, hallucinations is because they have excess dopamine. And so this particular antipsychotic medication would target dopamine receptors and block those hallucinatory exper experiences. But in the the drawback was that it sometimes produced these kind of facial grimacing that you see on the right. They may have uncontrollable movement with their tongues um, and kind of scrunched up faces and that kind of thing. The second generation antipsychotic drugs, which targeted the dopamine 1, the D1 receptors, found um, 
they were found to affect metabolism. And so there was some people who found weight gain on the medication. And I think with every drug that you um, see on the market, there are side effects. The second generation drugs have fewer side effects, but there still are problems involved. The second group of drugs is anti-anxiety medication. So for the five disorders we talked about, whether it was GAD, panic disorder, phobic disorder, OCD, or PTSD, anti-anxiety medication oftentimes can alleviate and relieve the symptoms of those disorders. What they do is they depress the central nervous system activity. And oftentimes in combination with psychotherapy, that face-to-face -face charged emotional interaction between the patient and the therapist, they combined can help a person learn to cope with frightening situations and fear-triggering stimuli. Uh, two popular anti-anxiety medications are Xanax and Ativan. Here's two pictures on the right. Again, drawbacks for anti-anxiety medication is that they can be psychologically and physically addictive. And we talked about the difference between being psychologically addicted and physically addicted in Chapter 7 when we talked about states of consciousness and simply psychoactive drugs. Remember, psychological dependence, they feel like they can't function in society without that it kind of alleviates their um, negative moods and if you're physiologically addicted you know that there are actual psychological or not psychological but physiological side effects without the drug so they may find that they um, have physical side effects in the absence of the drug and they don't like that so they may take the anti-anxiety meds to keep um, the, their feelings of normalcy Antidepressant drugs lift people from a depressed state. We know um, that norepinephrine and serotonin are the two neuro neurotransmitters related to mood. And uh, low levels of serotonin can cause depression. Um, sometimes people who have um, excess of norepinephrine can be in a manic state. So they look at... Um, Elevating arousal and mood that sometimes appears scarce in depression. People who also have low levels of norepinephrine might be in a depressed state as well. So Prozac, Zoloft, Paxil are common antidepressants that have proven to be effective. These are drugs that are referred to as SSRIs. And that's because they block the reuptake of serotonin. Reuptake means absorption. So what happens is the drug like Prozac, Zoloft, and Paxil will bind to the receptor sites of the neurotransmitters and the receiving dendrite, and they allow for the serotonin to stay in the system instead of being reabsorbed back up into the axon terminal. Dual action antidepressants block the reuptake of both norepinephrine and serotonin, but do have a greater risk of side effects. Some of those side effects can include dry mouth, weight gain, hypertension, or dizzy spells. And the last slide that we're going to be talking about is dealing with mood stabling medications. Um, the main one you need to be aware of is lithium. Now, mood stabilizing medications are in particular used to treat bipolar disorders with the alternating moods of manic, euphoric states, and the depressed lows. And um, it does simply stabilize that chemical imbalance in the brain that is present in someone with this disorder. And that's it, because I think this next one is on ECT therapy, and we had that in our presentations.